Hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, GMI live panel discussion. Uh, we are here today. We're going to be talking about syphilis and all things related to syphilis and men who have sex with men. Um, in this in this online event with uh, colleagues from the Love Tank, Positivist, and Spectra, uh, which I'll get to introduce themselves in a minute. My I'm going to start with with myself. So my name is. Jose Mejia, and I'm the HIV peer support manager at Metro Charity. And, and yeah, Metro is one of the partners of the GMI. And, and I'll leave it to you guys to introduce, to introduce yourselves. So, Will, if you want to start. Hey, good evening, Jose. Thank you so much for hosting us tonight. I'm Will Nutland. I'm one of the co founders of The Love Tank. It's such a delight to be here tonight. The Love Tank has been working on a number of projects, including Prepster. Um, but why it's really relevant um, for us tonight is that um, for the last two years, we've run a project called Long Time No Syphilis. Um, and I hope we'll get to talk a little bit more about our work as the evening progresses. Great. Thank you, Will. John. Um, yeah, hi everybody. Hi, uh, thanks Jose again for the invitation to join the panel. Uh, my name is John Dugdale and I'm the operations manager at Spectra, one of the partners of the GMI, along with kind of colleagues here, Positive East, Love Tank, and Metro, and kind of work predominantly around um, operational approach to kind of outreach work um, in and around London. So, yeah, thank you. Peter. Thank Hi, you, John. Uh, hi everyone uh my name's peter and i'm the prevention and testing team manager at positive east um and i also uh line manage the outreach team for the gmi partnership um so hopefully we'll be able to sort of share um some of the conversations that we have when we're out in different venues about sexual health and sexual well-being including um syphilis and thanks for having us Great. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all. And, and yeah, it's, it's really nice to, to have you. And I think, yeah, let's just get, get started with, with uh, yeah, why, why, what is syphilis and, and why this focus on, on, on men who have sex with men? Uh, and, and if anyone wants to answer the question, uh, go for it. So, um, so Jose, um, it's really important that we're having this conversation right now because syphilis is on the increase. Um, we will, we should expect to have seen a little dip in syphilis diagnosis because of COVID. We know that lots of us um, either uh, stopped having sex during lockdown or reduced the numbers of sexual partners. Um, but syphilis has been on the increase, um, particularly in London, for for the last five or six years. Um, it's a bacteria infection. It's generally sexually transmitted, and um, one of the one of the reasons why it's so important to be having these conversations is if, is if the syphilis goes untreated, it can have really nasty long term implications on our health. At the most extreme cases, it can cause brain damage. It can um, make us go uh, deaf or blind. Um, it can make us really really poorly. Um, if it's if it's not treated, the, the good news, and I know that we're going to say this um, a lot tonight, that um, it's really easy to be tested for syphilis, um, and if you do test positive for syphilis, it's actually it's actually reasonably um, easy to treat. I don't think any of us would say that syphilis treatment is necessarily um, very pleasant. I know a couple of us. I'm um, here tonight. We're talking just before we we went live about. Um, about the, the challenges of being treated for syphilis, so let's not pretend it's, it's necessarily very very pleasant. Uh, but the good news is that testing is really easy, treatment is really easy, and it's free on the National Health Service for everybody, all of us, regardless of whether we were born in the UK, whether we're visiting, um, whether we're um, here to study, or whether we've just visited all of our national health sexual health services are free for all of us. All right, so, so I, I guess the, the, the next question could be, why do we think that London is, it, that London is particularly, or, than, or that there's that particular sort of increase in, in cities like London, and, and why the focus on, of men who have sex with men? And, and I don't know, John, if you want to say something about that. You're on mute, John. You know, after 18 months of being on these things, you think we know how to unmute ourselves. Um, I just kind of heading back to what Phil said, um, to, to what Will said. Um, 
you know, of what syphilis is. I mean, I, I, again, I mentioned off, off camera before we came on how, you know, it's um, quite amazing to me to kind of the sort of the history of it and how you know long it's it's been around. You know, I find it um, really amazing that, you know, this is something that, you know, the first reported case was back in the 1400s, which is mad, you know, and the fact that, um, you know, obviously the treatments back then were kind of like, if we think having a, you know, an injection in your backside is bad, but, you know, I'll, I'll allow you to read the Wikipedia page on yourselves. Um, it's, um, I think as well, it's, you know, it's now, it, it's here and, and it's the scary thing is is that, you know, um, we, we do really well and then it's, it seems to come back and, and the fact that it's kind of more prevalent and has become more prevalent over the past five years. Um, is of concern that you know it's 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 kind of one of those things that seems to kind of just come back and we're, we're, you know we're, we're not sure why. Um, I think for you know the prevalence of um, why it's we've seen an increase in men have sex with men. Um, I, I don't know. I you know it's uh, possible that you know for some reason um, um, the chaoticness of of kind of um, a life you know the, the lifestyle of uh, men who have sex with men perhaps, you know, um, sort of um, alludes to perhaps people not taking as care as much when it comes to, uh, to, to kind of STIs. You know, we do a lot of, we, we do an amazing lot of work about encouraging people to um, to be aware of taking PrEP, to about HIV. And, you know, some people I've talked to, you know, they're, you know, you know an STI to them is just, it's an inconvenience. It's two weeks of antibiotics, that's it. And, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do, of which, you know, like Will and the guys at the Love Tank, you know, just amazingly do about trying to encourage people to be more aware of syphilis, gonorrhea, the other kind of STIs, because um, I don't know, in some in some weird off world, will these kind of things overtake HIV? I, I don't know. It's, it's, um, it's a scary thought, but it's, you know, um, it's a possibility, maybe. Yeah, and, and I guess sometimes it's some, somehow it's fair to say that probably London is a, a sexually active city in which, yeah, there, there is sex yeah. going on. I, you know, I mean, just anecdotally, um, you know, it's not just London. You know, we think of lower London as, as the centre of all, you know, the, the world, and that's it's a great place. But you know, friends in Leeds, you know, I've, you know, they've they've experienced high, um, high, you know, new cases. Manchester, you know, a lot of the kind of big. Um, kind of, you know, metropolises around the UK have seen it as well. You know, um, it's and it's kind of again amazing to kind of talk with people who, um, you know, we've been fed this message over the past eighteen months. How you know we would, we, you know, we had to kind of stay indoors, we had to follow sort of, um, you know, procedures and so on and so forth. But we know from our kind of research anyway over the past eighteen that there was still a, a fairly high level of activity of, of people having sex, you know, and not within their own homes and that's a natural thing, you know, people, it would be, would do it, they would get out, but um, yeah, so um, it's just, a, you know, a bit concerning that there is this increase, I think, that um, perhaps could only get, might only get better, or worse before it gets better, who knows? I think, to, I think to add to that, I, I, I think with somewhere like London and some of those other sort of metropolitan city places that there's a transient nature of work and study and play and it's very attractive for a lot of people because actually we can connect with one another and we can form those bonds and relationships and for some people they might just be coming in for a work trip or for a holiday or for sex and that's a wonderful thing but also part of part of the problem and it, I think we, we would be amiss if we didn't talk about things like commissioning and investment in services is often it's based on kind of like my residence in my turf and that's not how sex works a lot of people and all services or people where people work not everything happens in the same space and so sometimes it can be it can be really hard if we don't focus on the transient nature of our lives and our work and our play and that sometimes we see um like a rise in certain stis such as shigella when there's things like euro pride on and stuff so actually we also have a lot of migration into london 
And so I think what we need to do is make sure that the messages are available to anyone that is coming through London and going out. And that often people, when they're coming into London, is they might have not had that same kind of education or access to campaigns or services that we know as people working in London are available. So again, when we're saying actually, you can access treatment and testing in London, regardless of whether you're local to the area, like it's available to you. A lot of people still don't know that. Um, so I think that that is a good starting point that people know that it's accessible. And also I think going back to John's point about the messaging around COVID and like don't hook up with people outside the household, is there runs the risk of kind of a sense of shame if, if you did have sex outside the household because sex for a lot of people is an innate thing it's a wanting a form of connection and particularly with covid it, for a lot of people they're really socially isolated and sex and intimacy is validation for a lot of people. It gives us that serotonin and that boost. And there's a lot of motivation for behind sex to form that connection with one another. And we should celebrate that and try and address if people feel any of that shame or stigma for having the sex that they're having. And with that COVID messaging and stuff is just being really sensitive for the reason why we seek out that connection with one another, which is often a positive thing rather than a division within a sense of community. Um, so I think that there's a lot of things that kind of can stack up against us as men who are sex with men and other minority communities. So, um, migrants um men of color that when you have a uh when you're a minority is we we seek out community and connection and that sex is a is quite a large part of that um, I, I would agree i think just to add uh you know having you know when i used to kind of work in you know delivering outreach in you know in as soon as I first started doing this kind of work, you know, I would, you know, talk to people who'd travelled up specifically to London from, say, Portsmouth or Southampton, or they'd come down, you know, and with a view to that was that was, you know, quite right that they wanted to leave their hometown or wherever, and, you know, just out just the, the basic outreach about information they weren't aware of. So, you know, I think you know we do get this very London centric mentality about things, and therefore. You know, and again, you know, in an ideal world, these things should be sort of, you know, you know, UK wide. You know, you know, just I mean, again, an, an idea, uh, an example is, uh, you know, a friend of mine who has just kind of been diagnosed with syphilis. Um, again, everything you've mentioned, Peter, about you know the shame of actually not adhering to COVID and going out because he was a single person on his own, living through COVID, needed that validation, needed that, and his association of sex kind of aligned with that you know went to the lead sexual health clinic and had an amazing sort of um treatment you know was no there was no judgment there was no nothing it, it was great so again it's 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 happening in some of the, the the larger towns but it's that wider message that you know and so it's kind of you know the people come to london and then maybe kind of then transfer it that's a that's a you know a, a concern as well but okay. Because that definitely shows a need for a wider conversation around syphilis, which which is kind of what we're trying to do in this panel. And 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 I wanted to touch on two things. You talked about receiving a, a diagnosis, John, and and Will. You were talking about symptoms at some point, like brain damage and those more severe symptoms. But what are sort of the initial symptoms, or how do I know if I have syphilis or not? Like what what yeah how because a lot of people might not know what they're looking for or what they're trying to 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 see. So Jose, before we move on to symptoms, I think there's another really important thing that, that we should say at, towards the start of this conversation, and that's that although syphilis has been increasing in gay and bisexual men, syphilis has actually been increasing in almost every single demographic group. So um, we certainly know, um, particularly in heterosexual people who are part of things like the swinger scene or the dogging scene, that there, the syphilis is kind of moving out of some of those networks of people that we might have traditionally seem to be diagnosing with syphilis and it's, it's moving out we are now starting to see um you know babies being born with um syphilis congenital um syphilis um that we haven't seen for a long time this is raising 
um, some real concerns. Um, but symptoms are the really in, are a really important thing for us to be talking about because Jose, one of the reasons why syphilis is often um, left untreated or undiagnosed is because often um, when we have syphilis, we have no symptoms whatsoever. All symptoms are in parts of our body where they're not immediately visible. So they could be um, inside your vulva or inside your rectum or, or inside your urethra. And so we actually don't, don't see them, they're not visible. Um, and um, or we mistake the symptoms for something else. And if you go and look on the long time no sif um, website, that's longtimenosif.info, we've got a bunch of stories from people who have had syphilis who are telling us things such as, um, I had a full body rash, I went to see my family doctor or my GP and my family doctor thought it was a skin infection and gave me an ointment to rub on it. So um, I'm not apportioning any blame on family doctors, but if you don't see syphilis very often, then you're going to misdiagnose it. And um, so very, very broadly, the symptoms I think that are worth talking about are that if you, um, if you have primary syphilis, so this, these are symptoms that usually emerge in the first 10 days to three months of being exposed and infected with syphilis, there's often a, a, a sore and often a painless sore, and this is often um, around the genitals or inside your rectum if you've been having um, uh, rect, rectal sex, um, anal sex. Um, but as I said before, sometimes um, these aren't visible. We think there's something else. The sore can appear and then disappear. And we think, oh, you know, that was just an abrasion or that was, you know, from having rough sex or something like this. Um, then the second um, set of symptoms called secondary syphilis um, can be a body rash, um, often on the trunk of the body, um, on, on, our, on our hands. And um, if you have a rash on, on your feet, on the bottom of the soles of your feet, that's often a, a, a symptom of syphilis. But um, Jose, one of the things I think it's really important that we reiterate to um, anyone who's watching this is that you can have syphilis and have absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. Have some symptoms, no symptoms at all. This is why for those of us who are sexually active, particularly those of us who are having um, large numbers of sexual partners or more than one sexual partner, regular testing is really, really important. If you are a gay or bisexual man and you are having sex, particularly sex without condoms in a place like London, hugely encourage you to test at least every three months. And I know we'll talk about testing in a, in a little while. Um, yeah, just to add to that, I, I, you know, one kind of um, place I, I never realized was, you know, was a, a dentist has reported kind of diagnosed diagnosing somebody with syphilis because they were treating somebody for what they thought were ulcers in the mouth um, that were kind of trauma through through kind of the teeth etc and that came back as a diagnosis for syphilis as well so and again they just thought this was just a, a common ulcer in the mouth not you know um, nothing more than that they just kind of got missed and these are things that the dentist just wasn't what you know had never seen it was one of those things that they probably read about in dental school many years ago and then kind of now go oh really well you know there we go so yeah i think that's i think it's a good point like in in that broader conversation beyond syphilis as well is we are coming up to what's typically flu season and again with covid and stuff is we can often try and sort of pinpoint symptoms to something else and not think of like our sexual history and so what we'll say in terms of that routine testing it allows you to actually identify those things and again for some people they might have been out of the process of testing for some people you may your uh the amount of sexual partners or who your sexual partners are might have changed over time we know that some people might have come out of long-term relationships or they may be changing the dynamic of their relationships and testing has changed over that time as well so sometimes it's also about just being more au fait and aware of the different types of testing that's available because i think there's still some myths around um 
and some fears about the amount of blood that it entails. Still he'll hear things about like cocktail sticks, umbrellas going down the urethra. And a lot of that kind of myth and fear can be further perpetuated because we're talking to one another about these myths that we heard like five, 10 years ago. So I think actually having that accurate information about what the test entails and like Will said about the frequency that we test, or even if you're in a long-term relationship, sometimes actually just having an annual checkup is always a good thing to do as well. Just so so you, you can also support and educate your friends and community as well. So, so there's definitely something about routine testing and we'll come back to that. We're, we're just gonna uh, watch a, a very short clip that, that will give us a little bit more to, to chat about. Hello, this is a video about how to get tested for syphilis. If you have syphilis, you may have symptoms like a rash, fever or sore joints, but you may have no symptoms at all, not one. So you might have it and not know. Now this can be pretty bad for you as left untreated, syphilis can cause serious health problems and you could still pass it on. So whether or not you have symptoms, testing for syphilis is the only way to be certain that you have it. You can test for syphilis at your sexual health clinic or by ordering a test kit online and doing the test yourself. If you choose or prefer to go to a sexual health clinic, the first thing you need to do is locate your nearest sexual health clinic. Sexual health clinics are NHS run clinics that deal with all aspects of sexual health. Once you have found it, make an appointment or find out if they have a walk-in service. Hello, Sexual Health Clinic. We can book an appointment for you for a cephalus test this week. Thanks for calling. If you can't make it to a sexual health clinic, then some areas offer at-home testing kits, which can be delivered straight to your door, so you can do the test yourself. It's simple and free, and you get the results delivered to you by text or email within a few days. Home testing is easy and quick, but if you do test positive for syphilis, you will need to go to a sexual health clinic to get your treatment. You can find details of your nearest clinic or where to order a home testing kit by looking it up on the internet or using our website, longtimenosif.info forward slash testing. If you do choose to go to a sexual health clinic to test for syphilis, a blood test will be done. If you have symptoms, a doctor or nurse will examine you. They will examine your genitals and anywhere else you may have symptoms. It can take four weeks after getting syphilis for it to appear on a blood test. So if you get tested and it comes back negative, you will probably be asked to come back for another test to make sure. If you're having sex with a lot of different partners, look at you. It's important to be tested for syphilis regularly so you don't pass it on to anyone else without knowing. If you don't get tested and treated for syphilis, in the long term it can lead to strokes, vision problems, dementia or heart problems. I'll see you next time to talk about syphilis treatment. Until then, long time, no syphilis. Great. So, so that video from from long time no syphilis shows some of the options of, of of getting tested. So either in sexual health clinics or through through SHL, getting a home test kit and doing it yourself. Which uh, we know so, sometimes people find it difficult, but there's also a lot of instructions on how to do it. Uh, and there's always services when 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 people where people can get tested. GMI runs a few of them, and 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 we all run some some of those services so so i think it'll be interesting to hear from you guys on on so testing is is clearly a way of controlling syphilis but what can we do to to prevent it what what are the the steps that we can take or the measures that we can take to prevent the the further transmission of of syphilis so jose one of one of the things we can do is um we know that um, if you don't consistently use condoms, we don't use cons consistently use condoms, and we um, are exposed to uh, the, uh, the parts of the body with someone who has syphilis, then um, it can be easier for syphilis to be passed on. 
But what I want to be really clear about is even those of us who may be consistent condom users can still be exposed and get syphilis. Um, earlier on, you asked about symptoms, and one of the symptoms I talked about was a rash. It is possible, it's not necessarily particularly likely, but two people rubbing their bodies up together, if one person has a syphilis rash, particularly if there was a cut or sore from the person who doesn't have syphilis, it is possible to get syphilis that way. So I want to reiterate for those people who are watching who use condoms all the time for anal sex or vaginal or front hole sex, you can still get syphilis. You can still get syphilis um, if you are giving or receiving blowjobs, for example. Um, and that's that can be quite a common way of, of syphilis um, being passed on. So I think that I, for me, I think one of the best ways of preventing syphilis or controlling syphilis is regular testing. If I am exposed to syphilis and I have syphilis, I can pass it on to my sexual partners until I'm fully treated. So if I test regularly and I pick up syphilis early, then I am and I have it treated, I'm not able to pass syphilis on to other people, to my to my sexual partners. I know in a little moment we'll be talking about um, some hints and tips on talking to our sexual partners. I know it's not always easy to do that, but testing regularly, testing as often as we can, particularly if we're having lots of sex and if we're having sex without condoms, is one of the best ways of preventing or controlling syphilis. I, you know what? I don't think there's anything that I could add to that. <laughs> so, so let's jump straight into the conversation. How do we have how do we have these conversations with with other people? Be, yeah. Because as, as Willie is saying, is is not easy. It's not an easy one. Telling someone that you just had a blast with, like, uh, uh here we go. Uh, so yeah, how how do we start these conversations? Or what and what are the alternatives for people who are not very comfortable in that process? I think the first thing for me is how do we normalize having an open conversation about sexual health and well-being with one another? Um, I think often sort of the conversations that we can have is kind of like in a very jokey way with our friends after we've had sex with someone rather than just opening up a bit more and saying like, did you have a good time? Was it sexually fulfilling? Was it emotionally fulfilling? Did you do what you wanted to do? Did you get what you needed from that um, sexual intercourse? And I think if we can, I don't wanna say less prudish, but that we can just be more open to talking about sex first and foremost, that we can relax into then having that conversation actually with our sexual partners so that you have a network that you're comfortable and that you have the language to talk about sex because I think where we need to give ourselves a little bit of a break is I think often when we talk about gay, bi, and other men have sex with men, we often sort of link ourselves in with this sexual liberation and that we're all doing it and we're all comfortable with it and we all talk about it in the same way. And the reality is that for a lot of us, talking about sex still feels like an awkward conversation. So often the sex will occur and then after the fact we feel a particular way about it and we don't know then how to communicate that and that includes communicating with us as as outreach workers and testers of kind of like oh I've, I feel stupid or I've made a mistake and that's what I want to remove is that fear and stigma to just be kind of like do you know what this happened what do I do now I think in terms of with partners I guess it's how do we have that conversation before the fact. Um, so often people then might want to have a conversation during sexual intercourse, but then they're worried about like, oh, is it going to change the mood? Um, is it going to be a turn off? So actually you can sort of outline kind of your boundaries and what type of sex that you want to be having. And particularly having that conversation beforehand of like oh when did you last get tested the reason i'm asking is i just want to make a decision on what's our prevention strategy or what type of sex are we going to be having yeah. and like will said sometimes you're the sex that you're having you might decide that on the on the element of risk or the likelihood of you um acquiring an sti so um if your sexual partner's 
aren't aware of like when they should test is us also being comfortable to be transparent about when we last tested or if we've have some of those fears around getting tested or what the treatment entails is being comfortable to be open to the fact that yeah have tested positive and this is a treatment that i went through and it's the normalization of those conversations but i think we've had a com we've had a discussion about this that there's a potential that there's some more stigma around syphilis than there are other STIs to have that conversation. And some of it might be that because of the stages that Will was talking about, about the primary, secondary and tertiary stages, and this notion of kind of like a viral STI in comparison to some of the other ones like gonorrhea and chlamydia that we talk about treatment uh, and antibiotics clearing it within a week, that there's, I guess, more of a casual element to those STIs than the severity of what syphilis can do, and therefore the fear equates the stigma, which is very similar to what we see with HIV. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree with everything you said. I think as well, just on a note for kind of um, feedback from, you know, when you've been on testing sessions or the kind of feedback you get from, from the team or what have you, um, there is this kind of well, you know, this stigma, this embarrassment when you, you know, you, you, you're talking to people about their sexual history and how often they get tested. And, you know, there's this kind of, there is this sort of shame that, oh, I'm not, or that I haven't been tested or oh, I don't need to get tested. Or whereas, you know, our job is, you know, and this is our job is to kind of almost, why, why are we ashamed of this? You know, we should be treating this as you go to the dentist for a checkup every six or six months. It should be that normal that, that you know, sex is an amazing thing that, that people have. And, you know, um, and catching an STI, no matter how careful you, you are, can happen. It's, it's, it happens, you know. So, but like you said, it's almost kind of like something that um, um, is, is hidden, is um, sort of shamed, is kind of... Um, yeah, it, it all of those things are more, unfortunately. But um, you know, it it's a shame. It's not. We there isn't a need for that. It shouldn't be that. Which is, I suppose, is one of the frustrating things for us as within this in what we do. So, yeah. you know, Jose, I was I was recently contacted by um, someone I had um, really close body contact with to tell me that he had just found out he had syphilis. He went for um, a routine STI checkup and and got a positive syphilis result. And I, it was such a respectful, beautiful um, engagement, the way he told me. Um, and and one of the things that I've really learned from both having been told um, previously by sexual partners that they have an STI or, or I've had to tell a sexual partner that I've been diagnosed with an STI is how we do it respectfully and without blame. And the thing that I've learned is um, when I have told sexual partners is, is what I tend to say is, I, I need to let you know that I've just got the results of a gonorrhea test. And I wanted to let you know um, because I could have passed it on to you, or it could be that you already had it before we had sex and didn't know, um, and that you could have um, passed it on to me, or you could have passed it on to other people as well. And I want to let you know this um, so that you can go and get treated. Um, and I think the problem comes around when we attach blame to that, even if we know for sure that that person gave it to us. And the moment we start apportioning blame, um, it adds to the stigma of, of STIs. So I think crafting the conversation so that we can, we can also co-own um, that we could have passed it on to that person is, is a tactic that I've used that, that um, I've, um, I've, I've used it and it's worked really well for me. So that, that's really great to hear. I think there's something in, in what you all are saying around one, normalizing, well, sex and normalizing conversations around sex, whatever the type of sex and, and whatever people enjoy and like as, as far as is consensual and respectful and, 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 and all of that. Uh, and then normalizing testing as well. And then, and then normalizing this idea of the links between, between sex and, and STIs without, without that blame, without, just assuming that it's the other person or that it was the other person or that it was me and I did it. And so, so it's usually removing what you're saying with removing that blame 
so so that's that's really interesting and i think definitely a lot of a lot of education to to do which which is what what we somehow do through our work uh but but yeah we've been talking so 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 i guess we'll we'll see another video if i'm, I'm not sure if it's ready but, but yeah an, another video on treatment so that so that we can talk a little bit about what how is it treated because i know john you were talking about the history of how long syphilis has been with us and with that it comes well the idea there's also in treatment or changing treatment to to treat syphilis and what we have now is completely different to what happened back then but but what what is it that, that we use now to to treat syphilis so we're going to watch another little video and, we, and we'll continue chatting in a minute Hello, this is a video about how syphilis is treated. So you've been diagnosed with syphilis. It's not ideal, but it can be treated. If your syphilis test comes back positive, then your local NHS sexual health clinic can treat you. What type of treatment you get depends on how long you have had syphilis. If you've had it for less than two years, then you'll likely be treated with an injection of penicillin into your buttocks. That's in each cheek. If you're allergic to penicillin, you'll be given a two-week course of antibiotic tablets. If you've had syphilis for over two years, then you'll get three penicillin injections into your buttocks every week for a month. In case you haven't already done so, now's the time to make that call to your sexual partners. You will also have to avoid sex for two weeks after treatment to stop you from passing it on. If you don't get tested and treated for syphilis, in the long term it can lead to strokes, vision problems, dementia or heart problems. I'll see you next time to talk about telling your partners you've had syphilis. Until then, long time, no syphilis. So penicillin is the the magic thing that we're using or not the magic thing but the thing that we're using to to treat syphilis and 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 i guess the the, the one thing i know it's it's really painful <laughs> it's it's a really painful injection uh, and and i know that from from my own personal experience so yeah but but i but i guess yeah i, I really want us to talk about that thing about that frame of of how much you need to wait and why you need to wait and and how to and, and again the, the the relation to partner notification and to telling people that you have it so that so that there's not that wider spread or wider clusters of of syphilis jose i think for, for me one of the really important things around treatment is that delaying treatment is not going to stop you from having syphilis if you already have it it's not a nice thing to go through like you i've also um being treated and and it is not particularly pleasant. But avoiding going and having that treatment will not stop you from having syphilis. It will make it worse. As we've just seen in the video, the longer you wait to get treated for syphilis, the more injections you're going to have to have. So it's much wiser to test often. And if you have it, get treated straight away. You could get away with just having two injections um, rather than if you wait for two years than having uh, eight injections. Um, it is possible, it is possible that if you can really not face having those injections and you can take tablets instead, but that's generally not advised, it's not the best uh, and most kind of gold standard uh, treatment to have. Um, so you know, I just want to reiterate, the treatment is not particularly pleasant, but believe me, um, it's much better to get it treated quicker and you if you do have syphilis, you really don't want it. You really don't want to hang around. I think that carries on what we, you were saying, Jose, as well about like whilst whilst people are on treatment, is abstaining from contact with other partners because you run the risk of starting that treatment period again. Um, so often, what they do with partner notification is is everyone starting treatment at the same time. So you're only kind of abstaining from from having sex with one another for the same period of time. Um, and partner notification is such a great 
tool, but I think like we've said previously, it's it's how do we normalize those conversations? And I thought what was really nice from what Will said is it shows a compassion and a care for one another. And I do think that where sometimes we can get sucked in as, as gay, bi, and other men have sex with men is there's been a lot of things that have kind of happened to us to try and kind of like break us up to create those divisions. We're already marginalized. We've already facing those kind of like battles and hurdles as a community. Let's let's support and look out for one another and treat one another with compassion as people. Um, and that's always the shame for me that when I'm having a conversation with people is that they don't feel that they can, um, be comfortable or confident to have a conversation with one another and to be treated like a person and i think that that's what we kind of I, i'm going to sound a bit fairy 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 <laughs> but they look out for one another a bit more and and give us give one another that humanity and respect that we deserve for one another because we really need to look out for one another there's there's so much going on in the world and in life that can divide us and sex and relationships and, and and community and coming together are so important um and and how do we normalize those conversations where we can have fun with one another and we can be compassionate and look out for one another and sometimes it's going back to basics of a really simple conversation that might feel a bit awkward when you draft it but you know that you're doing that with positive intent and you can't often control how someone responds to it, but you've done it for all of the right reasons and we should really be celebrating the people that are putting themselves out there and making themselves vulnerable when they send that message. I think that that's really amazing what you're saying, Peter, and that's a really good reminder, just telling people that you're doing it and, and that you can control the reaction. So so hopefully if we look after one another, the reaction will be less. Yeah, it will, it will be good, uh, but but that regardless of, of the reaction, you're just doing it for the right reason. So that's a great reminder. I just, I just wanted to say two more things, and it was like that there's the option of you not telling people if you don't want to, and there's someone who can do that for you. So sexual health clinics can do that for you. Uh, and, and the other thing I wanted to say was we, we're talking about abstaining, abstaining from sex uh, two weeks after this happens. Many of us don't like doing that or don't find that easy uh, but but i think it's really important particularly for what we were saying about oh, condoms and how yeah we 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 might want to trick ourselves saying oh if it's fine if i'll use a condom it'll be fine but as we heard before it, it's not there's still a chance that you might be passing civilly so on so so do yeah as hard as it is it's a moment for for you to be with yourself and to explore sex and pleasure with with yourself while while things get get sorted uh, yeah, and, and I think that kind of, um, unless there's anything else that you guys want to see, I, I was I was going to move us to another sort of topic, but unless. No, I mean, I just to add, just to add, I think like Will, um, you know, it's, I think again, it comes back to this this kind of this, we, we, you know, we get it's regular testing, you know, it's if we do test and we, you know, we, you know, and if you're kind of, you know having a you know a regular sex and, and and that just becomes part of the norm you know it perhaps then results in the fact that you won't have to endure what is quite an uncomfortable experience you know so um and you know we you know, i know people who've had it and they've made light of it but it's it's really unpleasant you know unfortunately i don't think we can express on how to some people how you know and, and the longer it's left the the work the, the more injections you have to have so the more uncomfortable it's going to, going to be so um yeah that's all that I, that's all i was going to add really great so so i think that that, that just to, to move us into another topic is I, I want us to talk a little bit about the experience of, of, of certain groups or of certain men who have sex with men, because we tend to assume that it's the same for all of us, but, but clearly it's not, and there's different experiences. So so there's there's two particular groups of people that I have in mind, not because they're the same, but, but one of them is people living with HIV or, or men gay men living with HIV and then the other one is gay men who engage in, in chem sex and there might be overlaps or they might not but but yeah just talking about why why it is important that that both people living with HIV and people who are enjoying or or, or 
or doing chemsex uh, know about syphilis and, and know about what to do and know about partner notification? So um, I would say maybe I can start with um, gay men living with HIV. So one one of the things we used to see was that syphilis was um, 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, syphilis was almost entirely seen in, in gay men who were living with HIV. And there were lots of theories behind this. One of them being could um, gay men living with HIV be more immunocompromised and therefore be more likely to, um, if they're exposed to HIV, to, to, to get it. And, and, and then there's kind of generally conflicting data on this, but most people think that is not the case, particularly because most gay guys living with HIV are on, are on HIV treatments and are, are fit and well and healthy. And we now generally tend to think that the, the reason was, was much more about sexual networks, that the sexual and um, positive guys were generally tending to have sex with each other. Um, and this might also explain now why why syphilis is, is moving beyond those networks because there seems to be much more network mixing, um, particularly from those of us who are using PrEP. And we tend to now be much more likely to be having um, sex with other PrEP users or with other, uh, or with um, gay men living with HIV. And this might be why um, syphilis is mixing now amongst networks that previously were, were maybe much more confined. Um, but there is something I think for, um, for those people listening in who might be living with HIV, and that is one of the one of the narratives that we've been hearing is that um, when some guys go for um, their blood tests uh, to have their their viral loads checked, um, quite often they might not want to tell their HIV clinician about the sex that they're having, and if they don't want to talk about the sex that they're having, they might not be tested for syphilis by their by their HIV clinic visit. Now, all of the treatment guidelines suggest that if you're living with HIV, you should be tested for syphilis at every clinic visit. A quick audit that was done in London of some sexual health clinics about 18 months ago found that that wasn't always the case in practice. So we're slightly concerned that some gay men living with HIV are leaving their sexual health clinic without being tested for syphilis and they might be using sexual health services for example online testing when they're not drawing their bloods because they think they don't need to draw their bloods because they're already living with hiv and not realizing they should be drawing their bloods in order to test for syphilis or hepatitis c so they're only doing the rectal swab the, the p test um, and the throat swab so it's really important if you're living with hiv and you're sexually active, that you should also test for syphilis um, as frequently as someone who is not living with HIV. I think just to add on that as well, Will, I think sometimes like we can also be guilty of that as organisations, that obviously a lot of our funding is focused on HIV, and it runs the risk of people not being aware that living with HIV, you're still entitled to to do your full sexual health screening and that we as organizations can support you if you're living with HIV because you're still having sex, you're still having a great life living with HIV and you're building those networks and you're meeting new people, that it's not always centered around the HIV. Um, so just sometimes to look out for those organizations that maybe are obviously a lot of their investment is in HIV testing, but they might also be offering STI testing. So for example, at Positive East, we offer HIV testing, but we also work with St. Bart's to offer full STI screen as well. And on the registration form, it asks you if you're already living with HIV and therefore we'll just do the STI screen for you. So sometimes, sorry that if you're living with HIV, it might require a little bit more work to sort of dig in and see if there's community settings that can offer you just STI testing. Um, but yeah, definitely make that part of your your regular sexual health testing. You're on mute, John. We <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, um, it was just to kind of, I suppose, to um, add on to what Peter was saying about, you know, like uh, Positive East, you know, we, um, uh, prior to, um, to kind of COVID and what we were offering um, STI screening as a routine to, um, to kind of HIV testing, um, you know, these, these kits that, that you can get, and uh, we 
obviously we'll put a link up at some point, which is, you know, if you're in London, you can access one from um, shl.uk, which is for, or, you know, people from all the boroughs in London can access. And, um, you know, a, a lot of the reason that we would want to kind of do them for people is because they get this kit through the door and like Will says, they kind of look at it and they go, I can do that one, I can do that one, I can do the throat. And they look at that kind of the thing that Peter's just held up, the little vial for, for the blood and, you know, and it, the instructions are kind of in depth and you're kind of like, okay, I've got to get 15 drops of blood into that. You know, I, you know, I've had people say they've sent it back. They didn't just get enough blood in it. And, and it is quite, you know, whereas to, as professionals, we're kind of used to doing it. And sometimes it's easier for other people to do it. So it's often great to be able to kind of demo it and send. And then, you know, people can do it afterwards. Sadly for us that, you know, I think the lab, you know, we would use the St. Bart's ones. But, you know, during COVID, we had to kind of stop doing those and kind of direct people to SHL. So, um Again, it's to echo the fact that the, t that the regular testing is is a positive thing, and um, you know there are other ways of, of, of doing it rather than you know trying to get to a, a sexual health clinic. These kits are great; just takes a bit of practice, I think, for some people to use them. And, and I think that normalizing testing is a really great advice, not only for 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 all yeah for all men who have who have sex with men, for people living with HIV, but, but also for for gay men and. Uh, I think we have to do it for everybody. It's just, you know, um, like Will said, you know, we're seeing this kind of, you know, uh, being seen in, in other kind of demographics and other, and, and other sectors. Um, you know, if, you know, we, and again, this is my ideal world. If, you know, if this was all you kind of taught from an early age, you know, uh, yeah, we do work with young people in schools and kind of, you know, if you kind of make this kind of you know testing just a regular thing and they know where you know people know where to go and there's no there's no shame attributed to it you know you, you will you know you'd like to think that people will just kind of do it as a matter of course i can only equate it to like you know we go to the dentist regularly why can't we what, what where is the where is the why is there shaming going to get a regular sexual health screen so, so yeah, I think if if if, if people who, who are watching are, are doing chemsex, the, it, it's an opportunity as well to start a, a, a maybe what feels like a kind of unspoken conversation. So it might feel harder to have in a in a setting like that or in an environment like that, or with people that you've met through 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 chems. But 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 it is the same advice: is have the same gentle and kind conversations with the people that you're meeting because this is your network, this is your sexual network, and and it is important to to sort of have those those conversations. And and I think that because I'm conscious of, of time, there's there's two more things that I wanted us to, to touch on and that would leave us on a maybe itchy note, but but we'll make sure that we finish in a better note. But one of them is uh, pregnant people and 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 and, and civilis and pregnant people and then stigma around civilis, which which Peter you mentioned. But just why do we think that that's the case? And yeah. So Jose, as I as I mentioned, um at the beginning, if, if you are um, trying to become pregnant or if you are pregnant, um, you will should automatically be offered um, syphilis testing. Um, and it's really important, and um, particularly if you are pregnant and you remain sexually active through your pregnancy, to consider continued syphilis testing. So if you've if you if you're in your first trimester and you have a, a, a a, a syphilis test and it's negative but you are continuing to have sex into your third trimester really good idea to have um have another syphilis test before you are uh, before you give birth we are seeing increasing numbers of people who are pregnant who are testing positive and um, for syphilis as i mentioned earlier on um it can it can cause all sorts of complications um for um, um during pregnancy and and to the the child um, when the child is born, like really quite tragic um, implications. So testing during pregnancy um, is really important. Um, and then um, the question on on stigma. And I know when we were we were talking last week um, in preparation for um, this session, I mentioned some of the experience that we had had um, developing the long time with syphilis work um, and the amount of we were kind of gobsmacked by the amount of syphilis stigma. Um, that, that, that we were that we were visualizing through the work we were doing. John mentioned earlier on some of the history of syphilis, and I think that helps to explain um, and rationalize away some of the stigma. But we've certainly been hearing from 
um, guys, we have something called My Sif Story, and we collect stories from people who have had syphilis. And we've heard from guys who were saying, um, you know, I told my sexual partners that I had gonorrhea and had no problem. When I told them um, I had syphilis, um, the reaction was completely different. And I think this helped to explain, you know, we've been talking about communities of, uh, of care, about looking after each other. I think this helps to explain sometimes why people are not being cared for or getting good responses when um, when they're when they're trying to tell their sexual partners. Um, we have to collectively really work hard to make it much easier for us to have these conversations for us to challenge the assumptions that when someone gets a syphilis diagnosis or gets an HIV diagnosis, that they're somehow dirty or slutty. There's nothing wrong with being slutty, by the way, I'm owning sluttiness. Um, that, but we have to really collectively and individually challenge this stigma. And if we don't challenge this stigma, whether it's about syphilis or it's about HIV, then people who get a diagnosis are not gonna tell their partners it's going to be more likely that people pass it on. And, you know, for fuck's sake, it's these are sexually transmitted infections. John's already talked about you know, normalising things like going to the dentist. But why should we be more ashamed of a syphilis diagnosis or any other STI diagnosis than we are of finding out that, you know, that we have have the cold or the flu or getting a, getting a COVID positive result? Um, we should be... Um, you know, through our communities, really challenging these concepts that STIs are somehow um, dirty or bad, and we should be nurturing our communities so that we can care for each other when we have these, care for each other, and have kind and thoughtful conversations when someone tells us that they've just been diagnosed with syphilis or HIV or any other STI. And, and I think it has been clear from today that we we are all at risk of, of something like syphilis. So 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 stop the assumption that syphilis is specifically to certain communities or to some groups or to some people because that's just not the case. And and, and we and well research knows that and we know that and, and I think we yeah we we all know that. Uh, and yeah, Peter, I think you... I add on to that around that often when we talk about men are sex with men, we talk of it as a kind of like a homogenous community. And actually we've got different experiences. We we have different lives that we lead. That we're so diverse in that. And that again, like you were saying, it's not just a community. So when we're when obviously our focus with GMI is with gay by another men are sex with men, but also for bi people and for the men are sex with men, their sexual partners might, might not identify as male. And so it's also having comfortable conversations with your female or gender diverse non-binary partners as well about their risk and looking out for one another. I think also as well as healthcare professionals that we can um, and, and this is anyone that's working into the health sector is not assuming the type of sex that people are having or the, the risk that they present with. So often there's missed opportunity when it's older people or it's people like like um, Will was saying that pregnant people are, are solely having, uh, are not having sex now that they've got pregnant. Um, so there's often missed opportunities to not have the conversation and just checking in and being comfortable to say like, Oh, are you sexually active at the moment? How's it going? Let's just have a bit more of a conversation about it. So sometimes it's us as workers looking out for one another a bit more um, and supporting on that. I think also as well to really celebrate the work of the outreach team that are out on the streets and having conversations with people. They've got their condom and lube packs. They're testing in a range of venues like bars, clubs, cafes, community centers. And if you see them out and about in their t-shirts or their hoodies and you want to have a private conversation or you've got questions and you think, oh, it's a silly question or because I'm a gay man I should know the answer to this question there is not a, a, a wrong question or that you're going to be thought of to be ignorant that you don't know the answers to some of these things because like we said often we haven't had the education or the access to the services that we need so please have that conversation with any of us contact the organizations that are on here via email if you'd rather not have the conversation in person because what we want to do is is give you 
that confidence and those resources to be able to test, to have the treatment and to have those conversations with your sexual partners. Um, so please do reach out to us. Great. And, and, and I think that just bring us, brings us to a closure and just so to not end on the idea of stigma uh, and, and, to, and to end on that note of, of, of giving people advice, I think I will just want each one of you to, to tell the people watching today, who, whoever they are, something that, that, yeah, just tell them something that you think might be useful in how to keep having this conversation around syphilis. And I'm going to start by saying these are all opportunities. You going to a clinic if you're living with HIV is an opportunity. You talking to your partner, these are all opportunities for you to 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 create a holding space to to open a, a conversation. So have have use those opportunities. Have them. Don't don't miss them. Whether it's online in the clinic, uh, on on Grinder, on other spaces, etc. With the outreach team, just use all these opportunities to to further the conversation and to improve the well-being not only yours but of of your communities. Yeah, I don't know if you guys want to say something before we go. Just, I, I think about you know having confident, caring, nurturing conversations. You know, if if you're if you just find out you have an STI, um, there's no blame. If someone's just told you that they have been diagnosed with an STI or HIV and syphilis, um it's respectful that they've told you and and do your best to respond um in an open way without blame and um and we will have to learn to do this we will have to find a better way of doing this if we're going to overcome um stigma around um syphilis and hiv in particular um i think for me it's like just you know don't think that there is no shame in in it this is the the thing for me there's this Shame, you know, I mean, just as an anecdotal, um, as I said, a friend of mine's recently been diagnosed, you know, professional medic, you know, some people would go, would say, should know better. That, that, that doesn't help, you know, it's, you know, we're off, you know, we, we all have um, kind of um, our, our variables and what have you. So I think for me, it's like, don't be ashamed, you know, don't be ashamed. I think at the end of the day, you know, the treatment out there is good. And, you know, um, there are kind of amazing clinics, especially around London, that will kind of you know, support you on that journey. And, um, yeah, you know, you're doing something that is, let's face it, one of the most enjoyable things we can do in life. And, you know, sometimes, you know, things just, um, you know, happen. And, you know, um, you'll get over it. it, it it's going to be fine. So it's, it's yeah, let's just, let's just kind of kill the shame angle. Um, I, th I think my sort of rallying cry is just to say that you deserve to have healthy and fulfilling sex lives and free of that shame or guilt. Um, and that if you have an STI or um, if if you're concerned about your sexual health and well-being, that there's people out there that will welcome you in with compassion and without that judgment and that confidentiality is respected. And that is what the GMI partnership and the Love Tank stands for in, as individual organisations. And I think what we were saying in terms of the main thing is that access to testing. So if you need support accessing testing services, if you're struggling to get appointments or to get into clinics or to take the blood yourself, because it's just, just not coming out just have a conversation with us and, and let us help you take that first test or your 10th test whatever that is please just speak to us because like i said you deserve to have really healthy and fulfilling sex lives whether that's one partner or 200 like let it be great great well thank you for 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 all your knowledge and for sharing that and, and yeah especially for for encouraging people to have a nice open and and conversation that will be beneficial for all of us so so thank you and yeah see you all next time thank, thank you, you.